Malifaux is not our world, but you can see it from here. In this special episode of Warlore, I'm going to tell you all about the setting of the game of the same name. Malifaux was formed from a wellspring of etheric power. The first beings to walk its shores became its protectors and caretakers. These were the Fey. They were a people who grew alongside their world, adopting new forms as needed. The Dryads were the least changed. They lived in the forests, planting meadows and boughs of trees that shimmered like brass in the sun. The Gigants preferred the chill and isolation. They could throw the bones and see the future, and preferred contemplation and an austere temple to the forests. The Sirens lived in the seas, abhorring the freezing temperatures in isolation. They made massive villas and fabulous island cities. The Sirens were storytellers and merchants, who modified themselves to be as colorful as their oceans. The Awa loved the cities of the Sirens, but preferred hard industry. They built moving mechanical cities driven by sorcery. The Owl were tall and strong, with brilliant eyes and warm skin. With their mighty hands, they worked the sands into glass and gems and wondrous constructs. The Dreaming Ones were the strangest of all the Fae, because their minds were always mixed with a realm of dreams. They tracked the stars, creating complex maps of the world beyond their own. Malifaux Seed, later known as the City of Malifaux by humans, would be the seat of the Dreaming One's power. They built towers of stone to hold their observatories and data recording machines. The city was strangely built as it took inspiration from the dreams and thoughts of people from beyond their world. There were others in this world too, elder guardians who pieced together fate itself. With their help, there was peace in Malifaux, and all the peoples of the Fae were in harmony. The Fae lived impossibly long lives. Progress was slow, cyclical, and each new culture would become all the richer and more advanced. Even in this harmony, there were still disputes. Jealousy over achievements or romance or secrets or power still stoked conflict. The Fae believed that even a single death would be unacceptable, and the tribes united to create the Autumn Court in the western Knotwoods. It was established to remind the Fae that they were fallible, and that together, they needed to be responsible for the survival of Malifaux. For every Fae, every one of their kind was just a facet of their home, expressing itself in a different way. No part of the world could be excluded or denied. It was called the Autumn Court to remind them of the fragility of life. Just as summer was powerful, it too would wane into autumn. All would be equal in the Autumn Court, but they would need an elected monarch to accept the responsibility of ruling. Leaders spoke to their people, and they used their wisdom to select a good king or queen. They chose Titania, leader of the Coven of the Withered Rose, to bear the mantle of autumn. All of the tribes pledged a portion of their power to the court. The ritual was sanctified, and the deal bound with an old magic. The eyes of Titania and her followers, the Autumn Knights, became like liquid gold. She could sense every stone and root and fay that call her kingdom home. Malifaux was united as one. The Fae returned to their cities and lands bound by magic and blood, and they prospered. Their newfound cooperation allowed for peace, prosperity, and progress. The people of Malifaux cured that which ailed them. First they ended poverty, then the pains of illness. A few even broke the shackles of mortality, living without end under Queen Titania. But perfection offers no chance to grow. Some Fae pushed to ever higher limits. They delved into magic that the feathered keepers of the Gnarl Woods deemed too dangerous to put into practice. They poked at the barriers between worlds. They engaged in forbidden experiments, motivated by pride and hubris. If the Fae had become perfect, then the ultimate act of greatness would be to create something new and equally perfect. Any who could consider in creating a true, new life form would undoubtedly be great beyond reckoning. In time, a few famous savants managed to meet this self-imposed challenge. These twelve would become known as the Tyrants, and their living creations would be known as Nephilim. Time for a short story about the history of the word Nephilim. Did you know that nobody knows exactly where the word Nephilim comes from, or what it means? It appears in the Hebrew Bible two times. Both times, they are unexplained, although they're related to sons of God. 
It's possible that the word Nephilim is related to the Hebrew term for fall. Perhaps Nephilim means those that cause others to fall down, or those who are fallen. Ancient texts from the mid-3rd century and earlier usually translate Nephilim as giants, or the violent ones, having interpreted it as those who fall upon their enemies. But later sources believe that Nephilim refers to an offspring of fallen angels who mated with humans. There are many more interpretations and possibilities, with the likely historical truth being that they were the indigenous Philistines living in Canaan. As for the Nephilim of Malifo, they are treated with some compassion by the Fae. They were cared for as a parent would treat a newborn, even if they would never be as attuned and connected to the world's mana as the Fae. But they were just the first crack in reality. Natural laws were bent and then broken. The tyrant's power rivaled and even eclipsed the autumn court. Their followers became legion. After all, the tyrants offered lives filled with decadent pleasures and sybaritic freedom. The tyrants chafed under the ancient laws built by the Fae. They argued that the Nephilim were their creations, and that they could be used and abused as they wished. The cities became beacons of psychic distrust and hives of betrayal. The oceans churned, the mountains crumbled. The tyrants had become more than fey, more than mortal, and Titania could only keep their ambitions in check for so long. The first strike in the War of the Tyrants was by a warlord known as Shazul, destroying Tsangor's seed and sinking it beneath the waves. The sirens were forced to fight for Meridian. The Autumn Court named the Twelve Enemies of Malifo, and so began the Tyrant War. The Autumn Court marched to war, and the Fae turned to questionable experiments and untested magics. Titania created Cadmus, the living parasite, as a spy master and made a host of her own dark, lethal creatures to fight the tyrants. All of them were too intelligent and escaped into the dark corners of Malifaux. The Awa, decimated by one cruel tyrant known as Cheruf, repurposed their crippled cities into weapons of apocalyptic strength. The few surviving Dreaming Ones turned the Celestial Engine beneath Malifaux City into a machine that could alter fate. The Fae built living blood blades for the true Nephilim, who now worked alongside the Fae to chain their creators. These acts made them little better than the Tyrants, but the Fae had no choice. As the Tyrants continued to overcome every weapon, Titania realized she needed a power greater than anything in the world to defeat the Twelve. Titania decided that salvation would come from outside Malifaux. Before her coronation, she had been the leader of the Coven of the Withered Rose, and she had been charged with discovering and safeguarding the darkest secrets and relics the world produced. It was in this time that she discovered the Grave Spirit. It was a being from the realm of death. Titania believed she had found salvation. She ordered the construction of a great structure known as the Kythera, near the ruins of Tsankor Seed. She told the Fae that it was a weapon to destroy the tyrants once and for all. It was not. When the edifice was complete, she spoke sickly words in a foul, slippery speech. It was not a weapon, but a portal, one that opened to the realm of death. A surge of necromantic energy was unleashed from the gateway. Titania harnessed this magic and used it to destroy the tyrants. It overwhelmed her body and surged to the rest of the Autumn Court, and in an instant, they all took their last breaths. Their skin went white, their veins black, their eyes burst and rotted. Those that did not die instantly withered as death began to claim Malifaux. A sliver of the grave spirit surrounded Titania as she battled the tyrants. She annihilated the physical bodies of the Twelve. As she stood, dripping in the corpse stain of the grave spirit, the Fae engineers of the Cathera shut the portal down when they realized what was happening to their world. Undeath had never been present at Malifo before. The surviving Autumn Court believed it to be an acceptable price for the destruction of the tyrants. The world was wounded, and that wound was the Cathera. Even with the portal shut and the bleeding staunched, the nerves of the world were infected with death. The engineers of the Cathera built a second chamber in secret. This was the Nythera, and it would draw power from the land itself to sustain the prisoners within. So many had died in so short a time that the Fae had no words for it. 
they created the necropolis beneath Malifaux City to store the bodies of the dead as the first cemetery in their world, though also to study the power of necromancy, immortality, and the grave spirit. The fears of the engineers proved justified. One year later, on the anniversary, during a celebration of the great victory against the tyrants, the Autumn Queen was besieged and betrayed. Hordes of Fae and True Nephilim drove the court deep into the Nythera. The Boltingen and the Rugeru, the guardians of the court, were all slain. Titania and her followers were imprisoned. For a moment, the world went silent. Malifaux lay in ruins. Most of the Dryads, protectors of the court, were imprisoned in the Nythera. The rest withered away with the forests, poisoned by war and the grave spirit. The Gigants disappeared to the far peaks. The Sirens had been dragged beneath the waves to serve Meridian. The Awa, their cities, and their war engines were destroyed, and the few survivors fled to the deserts. The Dreaming Ones and their realm had been corrupted, eaten by the tyrant Nightmare. The Autumn Court was disbanded. Civilization was in ruins. Titania's remaining supporters were hunted down. The revolt against the Queen had been particularly costly. Their numbers were reduced from the wars, and still more Fey had to be killed to ensure peace. The Fey were broken, never to recover. The true Nephilim were not so traumatized. They had never known the idyllic world of the Fey. They worked alongside the Fae to rebuild until a true Nephilim began mutating. The tyrants had spent centuries slowly recovering from their termination, and soon they'd be back to torment Malifaux once again. The remaining Arcanists gathered engineers and mages to forge prisons capable of holding the tyrants. They built engines like the Talos, but all of their creations failed. That was until a nameless voice offered guidance. Her power was unknowable, and it rivaled that of the tyrants. This nameless instructed the engineers to build prisons from the magic of the tyrants themselves. The tyrants would refuse to break free, for destroying their prisons would therefore destroy their own power at the same time. Meridian was bound in the water. Cheruf was bound in the stars. Witness, a tyrant who had worked with the council, was still entombed in a soulstone geode all the same, forced to reflect on faded glories. Nightmare disappeared into the realm of dreams. Fortune vanished entirely. Plague was locked in the necropolis beneath Malifaux City. Despair was locked into a puzzle box. One by one, they all fell, save for the nameless being. The Kythera Council disbanded, each of its members entombing themselves alongside the precious relics and the tools used to lock up the Twelve Tyrants. The Thirteenth Tyrant was betrayed as well, and her physical form was sealed away. Quiet. True quiet reigned over the world. The few surviving Fae led their people away from the cities and into the wilds. They marched north, into the mountains. They crawled underground. Some wandered west beyond the deserts. Others disappeared beneath the waves. Others went back to the forests from where the first Fae had been born. The true Nephilim were alone. <laughs>